Okay, so we're going to be covering session 27 from the Law of One today. Um, very juicy. Very looking forward to that. Before we get into it, I'll just um, take a moment and open up our study container with some gratitude and acknowledgement of our teachers of Ra and the entities of the Confederation. Those higher density teachers who make themselves available to us in the inner planes and in our own subconscious experience, always available to us to help us to come into alignment with truth and our deeper nature as the one infinite creator, living and pursuing understanding of the mystery and of our role in it. So my deep gratitude to those of Ra and to the Confederation and also to the LL Research Group who helped us to have access to this teaching, this information. Yeah, sending my gratitude and thanks and love to all those beings. Okay, let's get into it. So session 27 took place on February 21st, 1981. And um, yeah, it's interesting when they were, as you all know, when they were doing this work, they, they had already decided they were going to publish books based on the transcripts. Um, and then this session is, you know, at the time it was going to be the first session that they were going to put into book two. So it's kind of an inflection point. It's kind of a turning point in the, in the material. And Don's kind of returning to the essence. He's really trying to be um, kind of uh, in alignment with Ra's preference that they focus on the philosophy and the spiritual philosophy at the law of one. So anyway, it's a, it's kind of an important session. And, um, and as we'll see when we get into it, it's a, uh, it's, it's deep metaphysics. So with all that, um, does anybody want to do us the honor of beginning the reading? Thanks, Caroline. Uh, how far do you want me to go? Let's see. Um, let's get through the first two or, you know, zero, one, and two. So we'll get through Jim's questions and then pause there. Okay, 27.0. I am Ra. I greet you in the love and the light of the one infinite creator. I communicate now. 27.1 questioner. This session, I thought we would start book two of the law of one, which will focus on what we consider to be the only important aspect of our being. However, Jim has felt the obligation to ask two questions that were asked of him by Paul Shockley. And I will ask those two first in case you're able to answer them before we really get started. First question is, Paul Shockley is presenting channeling. Correction, Paul Shockley is presently channeling the same source, which Edgar Casey channeled. And Paul has received information that he took part in the design and construction of the Egyptian pyramids. Can you tell us what his role was in that effort? Ra, I am Ra. This was in your space-time continuum, two periods and two lifetimes. The first of a physical nature, working with Confederation entities and what you know of as Atlantis this approximately 13,000 of your years ago. This memory, shall we say, being integrated into the unconscious of the mind-body-spirit complex of this entity due to its extreme desire to remember the service of healing and polarization possible by the me mechanic mechanisms of the crystal and the charged healer. The second experience being approximately 1,000 of your years later, during which experience this entity prepared in some part the consciousness of the people of what you now call Egypt, that they were able to offer the calling that enabled those of our social memory complex to walk among your peoples. During this life experience, this entity was of a priest and teaching nature and succeeded in remembering in semi-distorted form the learned teachings of the Atlantean pyramidal experiences. Thus, this entity became a builder of the archetypal thought of the law of one with distortion towards healing, which aided our people and bringing this through into a physical manifestation of what you will call a later period in your time measurement. 27.2 questioner. The second question is, Paul has also received information that mentions that there were other beings aiding in the construction of the pyramids 
who were not fully materialized in the third density. They were materialized from the waist up to their heads, but were not materialized from the waist down to their feet. Did such entities exist in the construction of the pyramids and who were they? Ra, I am Ra. Consider, if you will, the intelligent infinity present in the absorption of livingness and beingness as it becomes codified into intelligent energy due to the thought impressions of those assisting the living stone into a new shape of beingness. The release and use of infinite and intelligent infinity for a brief, excuse me, for a brief period begins to absorb all the consecutive or interlocking dimensions, thus offering brief glimpses of those projecting to the material their thought. These beings thus beginning to materialize but not remaining visible. These beings were the thought form or third density visible manifestation of our social memory complex as we offered contact from our intelligent inf infinity to the intelligent infinity of the stone. 20, was I? This yeah, one let's too? pause there. That's good. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Has anyone heard of Paul Shockley? I have, but I don't remember much about him. I okay. did Edgar Casey, I know of, but very well. Yeah. But, you know. Well, what we know about Edgar Casey, what we've learned from Ra of Edgar Casey when when Don asked about Casey's channelings, I believe Ra said that um, Edgar Casey's source for the channelings was not an entity; it was in fact the Akashic records. So yeah. he was reading the Akashic records. Yeah. Um, so I guess. Paul Shockley was also doing a similar kind of work, tapping into that source and bringing through information. And I guess, I don't know exactly what the relationship between Paul Shockley and the LL group would be, but they were very tuned in. I mean, they were they were probably one of the primary, you know, central researchers of the time from the United States, tuning into like channeling work, UFO research work, all sorts of paranormal stuff. So they would, you know, it's not surprising to me that they would have been in correspondence with Paul or, or, you know, I don't know if it was on his own or working with a group. And so it seems like what's going on is Paul reported to them some, um, you know, some of his experience and findings from his channeling work and had these, had this experience or had this information come through about working in Egypt and working. Um, yeah. Seeing something that had to do with his, his role in past lives and it seems like Paul had a, a incarnation in Atlantis and then a thousand years later had another incarnation in Egypt and was a priest and was of the distortion of the law of one and his you know his service in that lifetime seems to have contributed to helping to create the the bias or the social distortion of the Egyptians which enabled Ra to come in and teach the law of one because Ra couldn't come in and unless there was sort of like a pre-existing bias among the people, like a desire to learn the law of one. And so it seems like Paul was an, was an Egyptian mm -hmm. a priest and a healer. And his efforts were, you know, contributed to, to the law of one coming through in that time um, in ancient Egypt. So that's interesting. Um, and then it seems like the second part of the question has to do with Paul having a, either being told about or having a vision of, um, when the pyramids were being built, the appearance of semi-materialized entities only visible from the waist up as they were doing the uh, the work creating the pyramids. And it turns out, it sounds like that was Ra. That was an image of Ra, the entities of Ra who were creating the pyramids from thought as they, as they have, you know, described in a previous session. Anyway, so that's my, that's my understanding of what they're talking about there. What what else? What do you guys did you guys get out of that or any questions or thoughts about any of those first two? Um I have a I'm trying to understand uh what Ra is saying in 27.2. Uh so intelligent infinity present in the absorption of livingness and beingness. It becomes codified into intelligent energy. So that's some sort of manifestation process. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Manifestation into, into. I, I guess we'll talk about this later, but intelligent energy, is that 
specific to space time or is that also in time space i would yeah. think i would think it's it's related more to space time it's the beginning of motion and movement it's the beginning of kinetic the kinetic phase of creation and yes you're right we will get into it more as we proceed but so basically ross here is saying they are using intelligent infinity and manifesting something in space-time as intelligent energy and that process and the energy absorbed in that manifestation sort of brings to beingness at least temporarily everything involved in that manifestation process which is them so for like a brief moment they they appear as if they were materialized even though at this point when Ra is doing this, they are in time space within the Earth sphere. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep, that's right. Yeah, okay. and you know, if we just return to like what we learned about what Ra said about this process, you know, it, in our time, in our kind of like linear time in third density, you know, they spent something like twenty six hundred years um, creating a thought form. It was the it was going to be the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza, before they manifest it. So they kind of like they were they were using you know they were using the powers of mind. They were specifically they were in contact with intelligent infinity. So through their own connection with intelligent infinity, they were able to make contact with the intelligent infinity of the living stone, what they call the living stone or the living rock. And they sort of basically asked the rock to form, to create the pyramid. Um, and they were able to do that because they are, you know, well-traveled along the path to the intel to intelligent infinity. You know, like the gateway to intelligent infinity is open to them. They're able to use that pathway. They know themselves to be one with God. They, they are able to draw on the infinite power that comes from the gateway of intelligent infinity. And they, and they use that to co-create with rock to create the pyramids. And then when the creation actually came into form in space time, it happened in a moment. It happened in an instant. It happened basically overnight, it seems like, literally, which is crazy. And then while they were doing that, I don't know if it was before it was manifest or as it was manifesting, it seems like, it's kind of like you were saying, Shang, it seems like, you know, because they're sort of like tapping into that inner connection from, you know, space time to time space through the gateway to intelligent infinity, the mech there's some mechanism as such that like all the densities kind of get blended and everything is sort of connect interconnected all the densities become interconnected and somehow there's a bleed through from sixth density or from time space mm -hmm. um and then they 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 appear to uh, to our eyes in third density for a moment while that's happening somehow fascinating didn't okay Paul Shockley was not, was before the pyramids, right? Both his lives. Yeah. Yeah. How would he, so he wasn't there to witness this. He just sort of got this information probably through trance, maybe. Yeah, maybe through trance. It says Paul has also received information that mentions that there were other beings aiding in the construction of the pyramids. So. I, I see. Yeah. yeah. But again, if Paul is channeling the same source as um, Casey, then it wasn't like some confederation entity telling him this. He was sort of he was sort of seeing it somehow, or like downloading it from the Akashic record. You know, it's a different kind of channeling than 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 this, and then also than like the other confederation channelings. It's not like it's not like there's a an entity who's like you know sharing information. It seems like when Casey and then also I guess Shockley were channeling that they were they had their own inquiry and they were reaching towards you know wanting to know about that and they tapped into the data bank that is the Akashic record to draw forth the answers to their questions so I don't know well I, I had a thought when I was reading this today when it mentions in um Ra's response in 27.2 about the living stone. 
my first thought was the philosopher's stone and i wonder if this was some type of precursor or there was a there's a connection to you know that was supposed to be this great alchemizer elixir for human health and things like that so is there a connection between the stone they reference here and or is it the same thing i mean i certainly don't know for sure but i love what you're saying and it makes it yeah. resonates for me because the philosopher's stone as i understand it is like you know it's sort of like a one of the highest attainments in alchemy you know in, her, right. in the hermetic traditions and one of the highest attainments in ra's teachings is to be able to open the gateway to intelligent infinity. So that seems like a direct connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, I immediately thought of that. And when I went and looked and I was like, well, that was like the base being able to alchemize all these different metals and then it could be used for human health and all these things. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if, if that had some possibility of being part of the Egyptian pyramids manifestation. Would they have used a stone that was similar in property um, to create that, to create the pyramid? You know, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great inquiry. And <laughs> another thing that, that comes up for me about that is like in the, you know, the alchemical traditions, Hermes is considered one of the great, the great teachers, mm -hmm. Hermes Trismegistus. And, um, you know, I th the way I understand it is that Hermes is sort of the Greek name of the entity, but the entity had a previous incarnation in Egypt and was known as Thoth, Thoth, Thoth. or Thought, right. or I'm not sure how you say it, but uh, it's Thoth. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, some people say that Thoth may have been Ra. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not <laughs> sure, but, um, you know, it's possible that. that the Hermetic tradition began, began with Ra in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Or it's possible that Thoth was another confederation entity or you know i'm not really sure but it yeah. seems like it, the hermetic teachings and ra's teachings certainly are congruent with one another they certainly resonate mm -hmm. hey neil welcome hey how's it going good good to see you so we we're just wrapping up our um discussion of the of 27.2 and unless there's anyone else who wants to say anything about that we can continue to 27.3 good to move on okay anybody want to read i can read before my phone spazzes out okay <laughs> all right 27.3 questioner thank you very much i will now proceed with the process of starting the second book of the law of one footnote see footnote 13 see footnote on 13.3 for information regarding the original books this i will assume will be a much more difficult task than the first book because we want to focus on things that are not transient and as questioner i may have difficulty at times when I do have this difficulty, I may fall back on some partially transient questions simply because I will not be able to formulate what I really need to formulate, and I apologize for this. But I will try my best to stay on the track and eliminate things of no value from the book if they do not occur during my questioning. Footnote three, any eliminated questions and answers have been restored, which is why we're reading this one. The statement I will make to begin with, I have written. It is, most entities in this density focus their minds on some transient condition or activity with little regard to its value as a tool or an aid to their growth and understanding of the true or undistorted essence of the creation of which they are an integral part. We will attempt by starting at the beginning of creation to establish an overview of ourselves in the creation, thereby arriving at a more informed point of inspection of what we consider to be reality. It is hoped that this process will allow us to participate more effectively in the process of evolution. I would like to start with definitions of words that we have been using that possibly we have not and possibly cannot totally understand. But since the first words 
that we use our intelligent infinity. I would like for you to define each of these words and give me the definition of their combination. I am Ra. Your vibrations of mind complex indicate a query. However, your vibrational sound complex indicate a preference. Please restate. Questioner, would you define the word intelligent in the concept of intelligent infinity? I am Ra. We shall address the entire spectrum of this question before defining as requested. Your language using vibrational sound complexes can be at best an approximation of that which is closer to an understanding, if you will, of the nature of conscious thought. Perceptions are not the same as sound vibration complexes, and the attempt to define will therefore be a frustrating one for you. Although we are happy to aid you within the limits of your sound vibration complexes. To define intelligent apart from infinity is difficult. For these two vibration complexes equal one concept. It is much like attempting to divide your sound vibration concept, faith, into two parts. We shall attempt to aid you, however. Questioner, it is not necessary to divide it. The definition of intelligent infinity as one part is sufficient. Could you please now define intelligent infinity? I am raw. This is exponentially simpler and less confusing. There is unity. This unity is all that there is. This unity has a potential and kinetic. The potential is intelligent infinity. Tapping this potential will yield work. This work has been called by us intelligent energy. The nature of this work is dependent upon the particular distortion of free will, which in turn is the nature of a particular intelligent infinity, or excuse me, intelligent energy or kinetic force of the potential unity or that which is all. Questioner, I'd like to expand a little on the concept of work. In Newtonian physics, the concept of work is what we call a force which moves through space. It's the product of force and distance as we measure it. I'm assuming that the work of which you speak is a much broader term, including a possibly work in consciousness. Am I correct? I am wrong. As we use this term, it is universal in application. Intelligent infinity has a rhythm or flow as of a giant heart beginning with the central sun, as you would think or conceive of this. The presence of flow inevitable as a tide of beingness without polarity, without finity. The vast and silent all beating outward outward, focusing outward, and inward until the focuses are complete. The intelligence or consciousness of foci have reached a state where their, shall we say, spiritual nature or mass calls them inward, 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 until all is coalesced. This is the rhythm of reality as you spoke. Okay. Let me stop there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nia. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all, this is the deep end of the pool. Intelligent infinity. <clears throat> Intelligent energy. Yeah. All right. The floor is open. I'm so curious to hear what you all make of this. It makes me geek out with the secret of light again all over again. Totally. Me too. Okay, I want to follow up on my earlier question mm -hmm. about um, an intelligent energy versus space time time space. Um, so in space time, I mean that's where you are. Where there's matter, there are things, and then in time space, that's where thought is. But being still exists in time space. Uh, is time space if is a 
being in time space is that considered intelligent energy or uh is that more the space of intelligent infinity or is intelligent infinity like i don't know if intelligent infinity corresponds more with time space or if that's like oh that's the eighth density that's where source is or maybe it's both i don't know right i uh i feel like i understand your question and i and i'm really yeah it's a great question and i share you know I, sh I sort of share it this is one of the places where i feel like um yeah my own inquiries into these concepts bring me to a similar like confusion or i'm not sure if it's confusion but i mean i don't know um yeah what is the nature of an entity in time space what is the nature of an entity in the context of intelligent infinity what is the nature of like yeah um it's Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I saw Neil has his hand up. Mm -hmm. It's it's not exactly on the same topic, so I'll wait until the question's answered. Okay. Is yeah, every is, go ahead, Sean? Is is every is an entity is is every entity intelligent energy? Like intelligent infinity by nature is everything, right? Is that, I mean, I know we're just like throwing words out there and definitions, yes. but yeah. So then like anything that's not the creator would be a form of intelligent energy, right? So then like, well, first, is that true? I mean, my understanding of entity and what what is the essential quality or centering? Like a, like a, time to, what is but the body mind body spirit complex or even a social memory complex is that a form of intelligent energy yeah well um i think entities have expressions in space time and are in in that expression are manifesting intelligent energy i also think that there is something about an entity that remains um distinct in time space um in other words i think entities you know like when we die we exit space time and we go to time space we exist in time space and we you know we do the whole life review thing and we design our next lives and you know there's all sorts of activity that happens in time space but there's no bodies we're not occupying a body there's no you know it's not the it's not the potential portion of creation it's the um you know it's more it's more in the unified state it's more a part of the spiritual world however we still remain an entity that there's something about there's something that keeps us that keeps the essential qualities of our soul of our mind body spirit complex intact even when we leave space time and we leave the potential i'm sorry the kinetic realm and we return to the realm of the of of the potential of time space that has more to do with intelligent infinity but somehow we remain an entity and my my supposition is that what what keep what what keeps an entity an entity is whatever its essence is and the essence is related to our logoic nature and what the logos is it's related to love and we'll get in we'll get further into this when we when we continue the reading love is like choosing from from intelligent infinity from all the infinite possibilities of what we could be interested in creating and interested in expressing and interested in um experiencing on behalf of the creator like that has to do with love like love is sort of choosing among among all the infinite possibilities choosing something and so i think each entity whether it's a mind body spirit complex or a sun or a galaxy is centered by some portion of god's infinite idea or what ra calls the original thought and so there's something like so so each one of us there's some gravity well there's some there's something that is a, an attractor that keeps our essential entityness intact as it travels back and forth from space time to time space and I think that's a portion of God's infinite idea. We each are stewarding like some unique 
something that we're uniquely interested in, something we're uniquely exploring on behalf of the creator is my sense of it. And so, and so entities do, I think entities do exist and persist in time space, but, but, it, but these are just, yeah, those are my thoughts on the matter. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Of course, this is all speculative, but that's, that's my response to that. How's that land for you, Sean? How's that sound? Did that answer your question? Did that speak to your question at all? Or yeah, it definitely <laughs> it definitely speaks to my question. Um, so it almost seems like uh, you're saying like in a way, the in an entity isn't purely intelligent energy or intelligent infinity. In a way, it, the entity bridges intelligent infinity with intelligent energy, um, and it sort of travels back and forth between both in a sense so it, 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 it we can't just say like oh the entity is purely intelligent energy because that's especially in time space it seems like we are operating in the f realm of unity so in that sense it's almost like the entity is working within intelligent uh infinity um yeah does that, does that sound right yeah i think basically i think another way to say it is that like before any any movement happens, before anything begins to manifest in space time or in you know through intelligent energy, like God begins to like think basically, and thinking the process of thinking is dividing the infinite idea into portions, and like we are we are portions like we are you know what makes an entity is like is some refinement of the infinite thought into some, into some direction, into some interest, into some desire, into some, you know, object of, not object, not physical object, but you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, I think there is division that begins even in intelligent infinity. There is distortion that begins before there's any manifestation of it, before there's any um, expression of it in, in form, in space time. Anyone else have any response to that or thoughts on it on this on this topic? Sounds very good, Aaron. Yeah, I was wondering if the like potential and kinetic had something to do with the first density being in the timeless state at all, and kind of there's the potential for fire to teach what earth and water how to become intelligent to move towards the second density and create life. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but um, you had a question on 27.6 of the going outward, 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 and then pulling inward. And if that's a metaphor for expanding out first and second density and then moving inward third density to figure out who you really are. I don't know this session and the next couple ones are very tough with like the physics and how to understand the creation more like scientifically is hard for me. Yeah, totally. You know, honestly, I think, you know, Nia was saying it earlier, but I feel so supported in being able to like, I think being able to start making sense of some of these deep concepts that are covered here because of reading Walter Russell. I think Walter Russell's teachings like give a little bit more of a concrete, at least they give me a little bit more of a concrete capacity to visualize some of these concepts that Rob delivers in a more mystical and poetic kind of way. Like I think Ra is speaking of these concepts in a really, I mean, it's precise in a way, but they're just, it's more poetic and mystical. Whereas Walter Russell's descriptions are more scientific and, and um, concrete. And to me, in my thought process, that that just helps me kind of build some more what feel like more clear concepts of what they're talking about here. And again, I don't I don't know if I'm getting it correct or, or not, but um, I agree with Nia that like Walter Russell, reading Walter Russell, like really gives helps me give some like imagery and conceptual clothing to some of these concepts that Ra's describing here. 
And I think that the outward, outward, inward, inward is um, the, what does he call it? Ra calls it, you know, the heartbeat. Somewhere they call it the heartbeat. Um, and that's, that, 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 again, that's also a direct parallel between how Walter Russell describes it. There's this primal pattern of the heartbeat, the out and the in, you know, and like, and and then I think that that is duality. You know, that is another way of saying duality, like the, you know, the, the, um, the, the so-called departure from infinity, which is distortion or exploring finity, and then the return to, you know, it's like, Outward is the, um, you know, it's it's the interest in being able to experience the creator, being able to experience its infinite nature through form, through the universe, through space time. And inward is the return back to oneness, back to the truth of it, it never left oneness in the first place. So that's the, that's the broadest, that's the broadest, um, manifestation of that pattern and that pattern like recreates itself at every scale like at every scale like galactic scale solar scale photons biological life there's breath you know like seasons planets like it's just that outward inward is um is repeated across of you know all scales too yeah i was wondering if it's like a like a balloon expanding outward in every direction and then it's pulled back into like a black hole per se. And that entire octave is a heartbeat for the creator to go yep. through every density. And then, so <laughs> can't even yeah. conceptualize <laughs> an entire what is it, billions of years. Right. I know it's such a vast scale and a vast movement. But another thing that comes to me through Walter Russell is Walter Russell says that God has two primal desires. And this is key. And the you know one desire is to is to create you know the one infinite creator and creation makes experience possible, but the second desire is God wants to be true to itself, which is undivided and unified and you know the one. So there's like this outward impulse in order to experience creation, and then there's return back into oneness to be true to itself. You know it's like it's I don't know. It's hard to put into words, and Ross says it really well. Ross says, um, um, let me see if I can find it here. I mean, they basically say words are not perceptions. You know, to try to clothe perceptions, our inner sight, what we, you know, what we're able to conceive of in our minds is not the same thing as, as the words that we use to try to describe what we're perceiving. Right. And here we are limited to words to be able to like have this conversation and explore these concepts. We're all perceiving some, you know, greater or lesser degrees or different, different angles on what the, you know, the concepts that we're exploring here. And we have to use words as a fairly crude <laughs> tool to be able to communicate about what we're perceiving. Um, and I think my experience is the closer you get to the Primal concepts, intelligent infinity being the most primal concept, the more difficult it is to use words to describe it. So, you know, good luck <laughs> to us. <laughs> and, and good for us for trying, you know, it's, it's, I think it's awesome. I really resonated with um, Neil's like talking about the densities, like almost like teaching each other, you know, as, as, as part of this flow and this rhythm, like a giant heart. And I was kind of looking at it too as an application and, our own human experience, like in terms of like the energy centers that each one kind of teaches the next one going up. And so I see this as the big heartbeat that, you know, Ra's describing, starting with the root, working with the sun, you know, and comes back and there's this flow. And then that propels us upward to be able to go into the next energy center and learn from that, create from that, come back, move up until you've, you know, reached the beautiful pinnacle of the crown chakra and then it's moving up even further but i i can see the application of this intelligent infinity with the rhythm and flow as such a heartbeat in inside each one of us as as a hu in the human experience experiencing spirituality the energy centers are here to teach us 
and that flow, outward learning coming back in our beingness, outward learning. But we all to be propelled higher and higher in states of consciousness, we live that on this earth plane, you know, in this experience that we call human uh, human life. But I like that place at the end where he says, that, or Ra says that um, spiritual nature or mass calls you inward, inward, inward until all has coalesced. This is the rhythm of reality. But I think we're, we're part of that continuum of first density, teaching second density, second density, and we're embodying third into fourth and into higher states. Each one teaching <laughs> sort of, I don't know, I see maybe that's my long history as a teacher, a teach, learn, <laughs> learn, teach experience. Um, but we need that rhythm and flow in order to propel ourselves higher and higher to that state of oneness. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I resonate with that. Sean? Um, I was just going to add, uh, like, when I read that, when, when this passage, I, li I literally got the image of Rod describing the process, the, how the universe begins and ends. Mm -hmm. um, I always... I always associated gravity with like the inner pull of the creator. Um, it's I, I read like I remember some somewhere reading like seventh density is where like you gain spiritual mass and that spiritual gravity pulls you back to the creator. Um, so my interpretation of this is literally like at the end of the universe, everything's gonna coalesce back into like one singularity which is not what scientists think is going to happen right now but maybe i mean we have a very incomplete picture yeah well on that note it brings up a question that i had about the central sun in you know in 27.6 ross says um intelligent infinity has a rhythm or flow as of a giant heart beginning with the central sun as you would think or conceive of this and I'm wondering this this I, this concept of the central sun always throws me for a loop. And I'm curious what you all what do you all make of when Ross says central sun? What do you think of? What is what is the central sun? Well, for me, it's like a everything's in a spiral. So there was a, a beginning spot, and I imagine it's you know way bigger than our sun. And I might be totally wrong, but in my mind, I just see that sun connected to another sun, which is connected to another sun and so on until it reaches our sun. And then we can connect with the sun body. So there's like a chain of just like suns somehow <laughs> talking and powering each other. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, though. Yeah. Yeah, I have a thought on that. Yeah, um, let's hear it. So, uh... As far as, uh, well, at least based on my latest reading, as far as we know, we don't know where the center of the universe is or if there is a center. Mm -hmm. And, and um, like the big, the, I, I think I'm understanding this correctly. I could be wrong. But like uh, originally the idea of the Big Bang was like there was one point and then it expanded to everything. And now... Uh, I think there are new thoughts that are saying, oh, actually, it wasn't just one point. It was just that the entire universe was really compressed. So it was an infinite state of compression. It wasn't necessarily a point. It was just like still infinity, just infinity was really compressed. And then that compression expanded um, to form our current universe. And so it's almost like it's still infinity, but it's like it's an infinite source of what we are now. So I interpreted that as just the original source, which is still infinity. And it's it's hard to like direct it at like a single, oh, it's like, oh, it's this point right here. It's it's more of like, it's <laughs> it's just like layers and layers of infinity, but uh, it is in a sense that our, our source of, of everything that, that we come from. 
Well, and I want to piggyback on that just a wee bit, that the one of the current, man, it's amazing to me how uh, the more we learn as a human species, I'll just say, the more science that we learn, the uh, less we know and the more uh, different points of view come into account that can be argued. Um, one of which, similar to what you were you were talking about, Sean, was that infinite infinity compressed. That the Big Bang, as they have come to know it, is actually a never ending process. And so, as they're like, "Oh, well, the universe is expanding because we see things getting farther and farther apart." One that blew my mind, and I didn't agree with the first time I read it, but then later on, I'm like, "Oh, that ties into this exactly," which is the idea that as there is the expansion, there is there will be a point of contraction back to that finite point or infinite point and then expansion again and then contraction again and then expansion again and then contraction again. It just goes into the patterning around how uh, everything has these repeating patterns, the heartbeat the breath, the expansion and contraction of the universe. And central sun to me is, you know, the debate of white holes in existence versus the black holes that we, we know about the, um, the white holes being theorized for is exactly the opposite of, the black holes where it's spitting out form and energy uh, and we just can't see it. So it was theorized that's the other end of a black hole, but it's in another dimensional space that, that so we will never be able to scientifically read, but in theory they fit. So to me, that reminds me of, you know, going back to the central sun, the, idea of a finite point is just so far away that it's it can't even be seen but that also i wanted to ask too uh aaron around raw said they don't even travel outside of the milky way and andromeda because it gets too weird after that <laughs> i feel like that has a, a validating portion to this around our ability to even understand I mean, it's not quite how I remember it. I think they do travel, they, you know, at least they have. And they do say it boggles the mind to how, how diverse the life forms are They discuss, when you discover, you know, distant galaxies. <clears throat> um, but, but they do and can and are in touch with the entire creation, is what they say. All they have to do is reach for it, and there it is. That's, that's the level of their unity with all of it. And yes, they do say it's it it boggles the mind. <laughs> um, so Neil, I see your hand raised. Let me just see. Can you guys? I don't know if you guys can see this. There's a couple images, and I'm pretty sure these are reconstructed. These are not like direct. <laughs> these are not like uh you know directly from a telescope or anything. But as far as I understand, the structure of the universe, um, you know, once you go beyond the galactic structures. Um, the pattern of it is, is the closest thing is like, you know, it's the, it's like the neurons of the mind, like the patterns of it, um, seem to be closer to how our, you know, how, how brain cells in the, in the human body are structured versus like, um, you know, the galactic structure. So here's just two images that are representations of the cosmic web. I don't know how well they show up for you, but. Um, these are just, you know, in my archive of images, <laughs> trying to understand these large scales. Um, and I think this is this is the this is the core of my question about the central sun is like, um, you know, planets are, you know, have they they they're kind of like mini solar systems. Like they, you know, many planets have their own moons that revolve around the planets, just like suns have planets that revolve revolve, revolve around them, just like galaxies have, you know, this central core that's ostensibly a black hole <clears throat> that 
you know, has this massive, these spiral arms that revolve around them of all these suns. But then once you go beyond galaxy, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a center. There's no, as far as I know, um, you know, astronomy has not, there, there's no sense that there's like some central sun, quote unquote, in the universe. Um, and I think this is, I'm just repeating things that have already been said, but there seems to be an entirely different structure that kind of returns to a much, or it, or it, um, what am I trying to say? It, it parallels or um, is manifesting a pattern that's much more biological. You know, it's much more like how cells operate rather than how like suns and galaxies operate. So anyway, when I think of, when Ra says central, you know, the great central sun, which they say a couple times, I'm always curious if they're referring to a galaxy and somehow all galaxies are just um, entangled or something. Um, or if there is some like structure to the universe itself that has a center to it in some way. Anyway, just a curiosity of mine. Okay, Neil, what do you what did you want to say? So I changed the words around a little bit and it was a little more understandable with the logos. And I was thinking that from the Yahweh readings, there's blueprints kind of passed down. So it would be like the great central sun would be the primal logos or mm -hmm. the more original thought. And it's kind of everywhere. And then it moves to the galactic logos of our entire galaxy. And then to our own sub logos, the sun. Mm -hmm. And so there's no exact point, but it's more so like the intelligence of the primal logos would be maybe the, the space time manifestation would be a great central sun. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it was maybe the logos term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so maybe if I'm, let me see if I'm, let me restate that and see if I'm, it, it, it resonates for me what you're saying, but it's like maybe the, the central, the great central sun is more like um, this, the primal logos, this sort of like the first impulse of the creator to create um rather than like a physical central sun it's more like a it's more like the first logoic manifestation of the idea of creating something or something like that i wonder from like this potentially isn't the first octave and what's been passed down were you know nine archetypes of the mind and potentially seven or eight densities and you know now we're at 22 archetypes of the mind and so it's just kind of expanding and I don't know, the more I think about it, the more crazy it gets, but yeah, I'm just kind of. Yeah. Well, that's all we can do. We can all just kind of <laughs> reach, you know, kind of reach into these deep, deep, deep concepts. And, you know, we're not going to understand them. This is not the density of understanding, but it does feel like it kind of strength, you know, it, it works out these spiritual muscles of reaching back towards the infinity of the creator. And, it, it, you know, it, it does something. Sean. I have a picture in my mind that mm -hmm. I, I want to share. So um, I'm, I'm picturing a balloon. And within the balloon, we, you draw like a little circle, like on the surface of the balloon. And that's our observable universe. Like do the limits of reality at least within third density, we cannot hope to get anything outside that little circle. And that circle is constantly shrinking due to the expansion of the balloon. Uh, and we don't know what's going on on the other sides of the balloon. Like there are other universes. I don't know. Maybe there's like, I I've read channelings where they say like, oh, we get visitors from other universes. And they describe like these inverse universes or these like really freaking weird universes. Maybe those are different parts of the balloon on the op opposite side end. But I imagine like in the balloon, like maybe it shrinks, maybe it expands, maybe that's the heartbeat. But I imagine that balloon, or at least what's creating that balloon, it's storing all the information from all the other universes. That's probably where we got the information, or at least our specific universe of like, hey, you should have two sexes. You should have all these archetypes. They came from somewhere. So I imagine there's like some repository, like some mechanism that operates the balloon that would count as this the the central sun mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, I get the sense of entanglement. Like I think that the the way that like either different universes or certainly different galaxies, you know, all logoi, all and it's how Ross says that, you know, the one infinite creator is present holographically in every iota of creation. It's like this like infinite entanglement and every every scale of creation does somehow share the same, you know, it all it all feeds back. The, whatever it's learned, whatever is it however it informs itself becomes available to the rest of it instantaneously somehow. You know, so all the all the you know when when a when a logos has a novel idea about how to how to you know how to um refine the archetypical mind and you know comes upon something that's that's interesting or pleasing to it that um that information somehow like feels to me like like it it becomes available you know in this sort of like universal hundredth monkey effect it becomes available to all the rest of them instantaneously i had a i was wondering if like if the central sun is a actual spot and they talk about fourth density like entering some new area of space like are we aligning more with that energy of some higher sun potentially mm -hmm. i mean I, I don't know earlier in this conversation i was i was starting to kind of like get comfortable with the idea that the central sun isn't a geographical center to the universe it's more of a like it's just it's the primal logos it's not it doesn't it doesn't manifest as some sort of super galaxy some sort of super center to all the galaxies it's more like a i don't know it's not, it's a non it's a non geographical concept the central sun even though center suggests you know so much of a of a geometry but um i don't know i don't know if i can just with words alone like try to deliver this idea that i have but it's like um yeah i think i would need i think i would need some visual cues to be able to try to communicate the image i have in my mind but it relates to how Walter Russell teaches about the cube, like, like each unit of the creation, whether it's a solar system or a galaxy or a person or a tree, <clears throat> they're all um, bounded by it, their own cube. And it's kind of like it relates to the concept of the Merkaba, which is kind of the chariot. Um, and, you know, somehow that metaphysical construction that is the, you know, each entity, basically, each entity has its own boundary condition, but somehow they're all entangled with the rest of them. Like, you know, each, each, every unit of creation is all a manifestation, manifestation of the one infinite creator. And anyway, I'm getting to the deep end. I don't, I don't think words is going to do justice to what, what I'm trying to. It, it's the, uh, if you look at the Mandelbrot equation, it's the formula. Uh-huh. So like no matter where you go in the Mandelbrot, I mean, like it's hard to. I mean, technically you can zoom out, but like if if <laughs> like within like the Mandelbrot, like no matter where you go, it's all governed by that that one equation. Yep. Um, even though it's not, I mean, it's it's like a meta, it's like a philosophical center rather than a geographical center. Yep, exactly, and it's so simple. The equation that produces that fractal is so simple compared to the complexity that manifests within the pattern. Right? Isn't it? It's just like a very few characters. It's not, it's not a complex equation. Okay. Let's continue. I think we're picking up at 27.7. Um, is that right? Okay, I'll read. Questioner. Now, I think I have extracted an important point from this in that in intelligent infinity, we have work without polarity or a potential difference does not have to exist. Is this correct? I am raw. There is no difference, potential or kinetic, in unity. The basic rhythms of intelligent infinity 
are totally without distortion of any kind. The rhythms are clothed in mystery, for they are being itself. From this undistorted unity, however, appears a potential in relation to intelligent energy. In this way, you may observe the term to be somewhat two-sided. One use of the term, that being as the undistorted unity, being without any kinetic or potential side. The other application of this term, which we use undifferentiatedly for lack of other term, in the sense of the vast potential tapped into by foci or focuses of intelligent energy. So basically saying here that when they say, when they use the term intelligent infinity, it has two meanings. There's two meanings of, of, of the term. <clears throat> okay, 27.8 questioner. Now, I understand that the first distortion of intelligent infinity is the distortion of what we call free will. Can you give me a definition of this distortion? I am Ra. In this distortion of the law of one, it is recognized that the creator will know itself. Questioner, then am I correct? Then, in assuming that the creator will know itself, the creator then grants for this knowing the concept of freedom, total freedom of choice in the ways of knowing. Am I correct? I am Ra, this is quite correct. Questioner, this then being the first distortion of the law of one, which I'm assuming is the law of intelligent infinity from all other correction, <clears throat> all other distortions, which are the total experience of the creation spring from this. Is this correct? I am Ra, this is both correct and incorrect. In your illusion, all experience springs from the law of free will or the way of confusion. In another sense, which we are learning, the experiences are this distortion. All right, I'm gonna pause there. I have a quick comment. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all right. Uh, where'd it go? 27, seven? 27, eight? Where's the definition? They gave two definitions. Yeah, that seems to address my confusion earlier about intelligent infinity because they it seems like one definition is like, yes, that's eighth density. Or like, go, like that's one definition is like, hey, that's pure unity, that's pure creator, that's pure source energy where there's no di di differentiation. And then the other seems more in line with like, it seems to me somewhat related to time space where it's like you're pulling for the, from the potential of what could be and making that into actual beingness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think this somewhat answers my confusion earlier about what is intelligent infinity and that there are two distinct meanings. Yeah, let me let me just see if I can build on that. Um, the distinction between the two meanings of intelligent infinity, the the concept of distortion, they bring up they bring up um, okay, they say in 27.7, they say one use of the term, that being as the undistorted unity, being without any kinetic or potential side. The other application of this term, which we use undifferentiatedly for lack of other term in the sense of the vast potential tapped into by foci or focuses of intelligent energy. So it's basically like, I wanna use the term distortion to help like draw out what maybe is a helpful distinction between the two. So it's like on one side, there's, there's intelligent infinity. Um, I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is that a distortion is is like an expression that is finite, like an expression that has, <clears throat> um, whether it's just a thought or it's an actual kind of object or something in space-time, it's like, it's, 
it's something that has been selected from within the set of infinity and like chosen by the creator to explore and experience. And that's so distortion kind of to me just means like like something <laughs> like out of everything that's an infinity, a distortion is something. But it's almost like something potentially exists within infinity, but it hasn't yet separated. It hasn't yet become it hasn't yet become like separated from infinity. And that's the that's the first use of the term intelligent infinity is like there can be sort of distortions that are sort of like um prior to their manifestation or prior to their expression there's they still exist um but then on the other side the other use of the term it's like the distortion has been you know it has been chosen and selected for and and has begun to be manifest in order to be experienced. I don't know if that's making sense. It's like distortion can be something that exists within infinity, but not yet separate from it. And then there's a distortion that is, you know, still connected to everything, but it's but it's been. You guys, it's so hard to talk about this stuff. I don't know if this is making any sense at all. Um, it's like distortion that's still joined with it's like a drop in the ocean like there's the drop of the ocean that's still joined with the ocean and then there's the drop of the ocean that's like a raindrop that's falling from the sky like there's the same drop but in one context it's still merged with its substance and in another context it's separated and it's traveling through the biosphere as a separate thing the the distortion of free will and the ability to know the self and with just i don't know i'm somehow trying to bring the veil into this and mm -hmm. the creator knowing itself and that being another distortion and i can't connect the dots Yeah, this is um y'all, this is some pretty advanced and challenging material. Um this, this reminds me of the little soul in the sun. Where it's like because so. you because uh was like in the story, it's like, oh, there's this little soul or like flame, whatever. And he's talking to the sun, which is like all the other flames. I, and then he's like oh yeah like i want to like all the little souls which are technically all just the sun they're like oh i want to be this i want to be that mm -hmm. and then uh when th with the veil it was like oh i want to experience forgiveness and then the sun's like oh whoa like uh, i don't know what that is and so then one of the other souls has to be like okay i will forget who i am so that you can experience forgiveness and that that's that's the veil. Mm -hmm. I guess they're all technically still part of the sun, right? Yeah, who's, who's to like, read that book? Who have you? Any of you other besides Sean read it? Yes. Yeah, so good. It's such a great, simple um, expression of some of these very deep. What was the name of the book? The Little Soul in the Sun. By Neil Donald Walsh, it's it's kind of a condensed version of the 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 larger book for adults he makes. I think I didn't read the. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say, Aaron. Is actually it's the children's book of Neil Donald Walsh's work. The Little Soul in the Sun is a distilled oh, version for understanding for for kiddos. Right, and isn't okay. isn't his most famous book Conversations with God? Isn't that his yes. life? Yeah, yeah, that's what he's known for. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Well, the little soul and sun is just this beautiful illustrated children's book that kind of like condenses that teaching into a into a you know an allegory for for children and it's beautiful it's bj bought she she's bought a bunch of copies to give it away to people because she thinks it's such a you know she it's such a great transmission of like these core concepts of what's going what's really going on here
I mean, it summarizes law of one, basically. Yeah, <laughs> like 10 totally. pages. <laughs> yeah. I have a thing. Mm -hmm. What's your thing? 20, 27, seven. Oh man, my phone's buzzing. Um, 27, seven, the footnote at the end, number four, the original statement reads a lot better for me than the, uh, human reinterpretation. It, it's the exact same except for the foci or focuses of energy we call intelligent energy makes way more sense to me than how they restated it. They dropped of energy we call intelligent energy and just put the focuses of intelligent energy. I'm not a fan of the rewrite mm -hmm. <laughs> for what it, <laughs> just my little tidbit. That's mm -hmm. I, I keep, I keep going over it and I'm, I'm not, um yeah okay so let's just let's just zoom in there for a second so so what got published was um the other application of this term the term being intelligent infinity which we use undifferentiatedly for a lack of other term in the sense of the vast potential tapped uh tapped into by foci or focuses of intelligent energy so that's what got published and the footnote says that the original was the other application of this term, which we use undifferentiatedly for lack of other term, in the sense of the vast potential tapped into by foci or focuses of energy, <clears throat> we call <clears throat> intelligent energy. So foci or focuses of energy, we call intel intelligent energy, or foci or focuses of intelligent energy. <clears throat> yeah, so they they chose to cut out focuses of energy we call intelligent energy and they just say focuses of intelligent energy. <clears throat> Uh huh. Yeah, I think I'm with you. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Nia. I can see how it's. It does change the meaning for sure. Hmm, I wonder why they chose to do that. That's kind of what I was getting at too. Is is there a reason they chose that? Like, I, I would love more description on why we think Ra meant to say it this way. Because the questions are around explaining <laughs> intelligent. What is the intelligent of intelligent energy? And then Ra gets into the philosophy around they are not separated, even though they are, even though they are separated as. Uh, vibratory complex sound complexes so like we were talking about they're they're interwoven they're um not actually separate so for me it feels like Ra raw's original statement was specific um energy we call intelligent energy so to me that that was more of a an accurate scientific mechanical type description of energy as intelligent energy um anyway mm -hmm. i may be nitpicking but to, to me that <laughs> i'm gonna go with raw's original I, I don't i wish i knew why i i don't maybe they know something maybe they tied something in from a different session that explained that differently uh, but usually they say that they're like well we changed this because or raw is referring to this session which i appreciate immensely when they do that because that does yeah. help clarify like oh let me go look this up again oh it's right there it's this session so i don't know why they did that 
Yeah, I'm with you, Nia. I, I, it's a good catch. I didn't, um, I didn't read that footnote when I was reading it today, and it's like, huh, that does that seems like a significant change, maybe. But again, like, you know, Ra's already given their dis their disclaimer for this in this session that, like, yeah, you know, words, you, you know, it's going to be frustrating for you, Don. We're going to try to help you give definitions, but it's going to be frustrating because when we try to use words to describe. Yeah. these things it's challenging so you know kind of in a way it's like no matter what words are chosen they're going to be um you know approximations and so well, whether it's Ra's approximation versus like ll's translation of Ra's approximation you know it's still a, it's still an approximation i was reading on love one dot info so i didn't see that footnote but now i'm looking at the ll research doesn't it mean the same thing like what's the difference? Like yes, they made a they they made a change, I think for clarity, but it doesn't change the meaning, right? In both cases, it's just saying the second definition is just to distinguish the potential from the what's being tapped into by the energy or intelligent energy. I mean, potentially. Um... In the original statement, they say that, you know, they basically they call focuses of energy intelligent energy. And it got translated to focuses of intelligent energy. Anyway, super subtle, you guys. I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think any of us are really qualified to know <laughs> the significance of it's different or not, but it does seem it, just from a logical perspective, it's like, oh, it's a, that's different. That's a distinctly different concept that is being conveyed in the translated version versus the original version. I think I want to say yes, Shang. I'm with you that it, on one hand it changes nothing. <laughs> it, it is an essentially yes um, that they are one and the same. So on one hand it doesn't change anything. The flip side for me is my brain is, is niggling that raw meant it specifically focuses of energy we call intelligent energy. So I, yeah, it could be Knox Nix. It, it also could have significant. I I've gone over that more than once. So my phone is spazzing and I can't mute myself. So I'm done. But please ignore any sounds. Okay. I mean, what comes to mind for me is like imagine imagine watching like a, a stunning sunset, and then the next day it just really touches you, really emotionally moves you, and the next day you see somebody who you want to convey the you know you want to convey your experience with. How do you do that? How do you convey, you know, the sunset to somebody? You know, you might try to describe it. You might want to like talk about the color. You might want to talk about, you could talk about how you felt, but you know, it's just, that's how I feel. I feel like, you know, like Ra sees the sunset. The sunset is like the, the primal motions from undifferentiated intelligent infinity into you know, the kinetic portion, different, the differentiation that takes place. <clears throat> like they're, they're able to perceive it. They, they can see it directly from their level of like late six density. You know, they're able to like perceive these things. And I think Walter Russell visited that space and perceived it directly, perceived like how intelligent energy creates everything through light. And then like, now they're trying to use words to <laughs> communicate it to us. And it's like, yeah. So it's almost like, you know, yeah, I mean, and in a way it, they are, you know, they're using, I think they, I think they get more poetic in this session than they, than they typically do, especially with the outward, outward, inward, inward piece. And they're, you know, they're just trying to um, do their best to conjure the essential qualities of what they're able to see and communicate them in words, challenging. To do all right let's move on um we got 20 minutes left let us pick up where we left off which is 12 i believe uh wait no 11 27 11 i can read great questioner 
I will have to think about that and ask questions on it in the next session. So I will go on to what you have given me as the second distortion, which is the distortion of love. Is this correct? I'm Ra, this is correct. Questioner, I would like for you to define love in the sense in its sense as the second distortion. I'm Ra. This must be defined against the background of intelligent infinity or unity or the creator with the primal distortion of free will. The term love, then, may be seen as the focus, the choice of attack, the type of energy of an extremely, shall we say, high order, which causes intelligent energy to be formed from the potential of intelligent infinity in just such and such a way. This, then, may be seen to be an object rather than an activity by some of your peoples, and the principle of this extremely strong energy focus being worshipped as the creator instead of unity or oneness from which all loves emanate. Is love, the questioner, is love, is there a manifestation of love that we could call vibration? I am Ra. Again, we reach semantic difficulties. The vibration or density of love or understanding is not a term used in the same sense as the second distortion love, the distortion love being the great kinetic activator and primal co-creator of various creations using intelligent infinity, the vibration love being that density in which those who have learned to do an activity called loving without significant distortion then seek the ways of light or wisdom. Thus, in vibratory sense, love comes into light in the sense of the activity of unity in its free will. Love uses light, love uses light and has the power to dire direct light in its distortions. Thus, vibratory complexes re recapitulate and reverse the, crea the creation in its unity, thus showing the rhythm or flow of the great heartbeat, if you will use this analogy. Questioner, I will make a statement that I have extracted from the physics of Dewey Larson, which may or may not be close to what we are trying to explain. Larson says that all is motion, which we can take as vibration, and that vibration, which is pure vibration and is not physical in any way or in any form or in any density, that vibration by first product of that vibration is what we call the photon, particle of light. I was trying to make an analogy between this physical solution and the concept of love and light. Is this close to the concept of love creating light or not? I am Ra, you are correct. Questioner, then I will expand a bit more on this concept. We have the infinite vibration of love, which can occur, I'm assuming, at, vari at varying frequencies, if this has a meaning in this. I would assume that it begins at one basic frequency. Does this have any meaning? Am I making sense? Is this correct? I am raw. Each love, as you term the prime movers, comes from one frequency, if you wish to use this term. This frequency is unity. We would perhaps liken it rather to a strength than a frequency, this strength being infinite, the finite qualities being chosen by the particular nature of this primal movement. Questioner, then this vibration, which is for lack of better understanding, which we would call pure motion, it is pure love, it is, it is not, there is nothing that is yet condensed, shall we say, to form any type or density of illusion. This love then creates by this process of vibration a photon, as we call it, which is the basic particle of light. This photon then, by adding by added vibrations and rotations, further condenses into particles, the densities, the various densities that we experience. Is this correct? I am raw. This is correct. Questioner. Now, this then light, which forms the densities, has what we call color, and this color is divided into seven categories of color. Can you tell me, is there a reason or explanation for these categories of color? Can you tell me something about that? I'm Ra. This will be the last complete question of this session as this instrument is low on vital energy. We will answer briefly and then you may question further in cons uh, consequent sessions. The nature of the vibratory patterns of your universe is dependent upon the configurations placed upon the original material or light by the focus or love using its intelligent energy to create a certain pattern of illusions or densities in order to satisfy its own intelligent estimate of a, a method of knowing itself. Thus, the colors, as you call them, are as straight or narrow or necessary as is possible to express, given the will of love. There is further information which we shall be happy to share by answering your questions. However, we do not wish to deplete this instrument. Is there a short query 
necessary before we leave? Questioner, the only thing I need to know is, is there anything we can do to make the instrument more comfortable or help her or the contact? I'm raw. This instrument is slightly uncomfortable. Perhaps a simpler configuration of the body would be appropriate given the instrument's improving physical complex condition. I'm raw. You are conscientious in your endeavors. We shall be with you. We leave you now in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. Rejoice, therefore, in the power and the peace of the one infinite creator, Adonai. Thanks, Sean. That's great. Okay. I have another thought. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let's see if I'm, I want to see if I'm understanding this right. So uh, um, uh, when I was reading this, I was sort of putting in the framework of the, 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 uh, the little soul in the sun. Mm -hmm. So like the first, the first distortion free will is like, Oh, a soul pops out. And it's like, Oh, what am I? And then love, the second distortion love is like, Oh, I think I want to be happiness or I think I want to be like courage. I want to be this. That's like the second distortion of like, I want to be something. And then the third distortion light is actually manifesting that that being of becoming whatever that love is. Is that that seems like a really simple and fair description of exactly what I have the model that I have of it too. I like it too. The only the only refinement is the first distortion, free will, might be the the sun before there's a little soul, the sun just becoming aware of the idea that it could create a little soul and then love is the little soul and the little soul kind of pops out because it's because it's said i want to be like the creation of the little soul is the choosing of something it wants to be out of the infinity of the sun mm, yeah it's a, that's okay. a slight it's just a slight variation on what you're saying but in general i'm, I'm really with you on your telling there and then towards the end, they they brought in, so now the little soul is literally the, like when Ra, when Don's like, oh, so why are there seven, seven densities? It's because the little soul is literally the universe, and it's does it, it's it's whatever it decided want to be. It that beingness is like <laughs> the structure of seven. It just so happened that. The, the the choice of the little soul wanting to, to pick what it is manifested as these seven densities. I mean, I'm so unsatisfied by the answer when, when Don asks about color. I'm so curious about color and the and the and the octave nature of reality and like why why are there seven colors? And their answer doesn't satisfy my question. But it seems to me that that's a primal movement. Like the primal creator is the one that um Kent, are you uh gonna whiteboard something for us? Um I'm seeing a screen share and it looks like Kent is pulling up a whiteboard. I don't know if you're intending to do that, Kent, or what, but anyway. Um so I guess I, I don't know if this is if I'm disagreeing with what you said, Sean, about the little soul being the one who designs the seven colors or determines that there's going to be seven colors, but it seems like when they say the nature of the vibratory patterns of your universe is dependent upon the configurations placed upon the original original material or light by the focus or love using its intelligent energy to create a certain pattern of illusions or densities in order to satisfy, satisfy its own intelligent estimate of a method of knowing itself, the itself there is the primal creator. Like I get a really strong sense of like, you know, Ross says the octave pattern is, as far as they know, it's consistent across all universes, all galaxies, all universes share that, um, that pattern. And so it seems like that, you know, the one who chose seven or what, you know, however that came into form was the primal creator. It's not like each, each logos um, would, you know, get to, differentiate that particular pattern. I don't know if that makes sense. 
What about co-creators? I feel like very little is spoken about that and is super powerful and very much a part of the creation factor as we know. Well, they do say co-creator in 27, 13, they say um, love is the co-creator. You know, they say, um, and it's like co-creator to me is kind of working with, because of course, co-creator as a concept could could refer to a variety of scales. A co-creator could be a whole galaxy, could also be a sun. It could be us, we're co-creators, right? And it's like, it's like working within the construct or the pattern that our parent has created to get more specific about what it is we wanna create within that. That's how I take that, it. That picture that you showed earlier about the web of, mm -hmm. That to me feels I've as soon as Raw first spoke about co-creators, that was what I zoomed out and pictured. Almost like you were saying, the neurons of the mind, the brain, excuse me, the neurons of the, the human brain, mm -hmm. that that web or matrix, and it I don't something feels like co-creator in there because it was the one infinite creator spawns co-creators from that main source. And I'm not sure how to put it into words, but I have, I, I, I know they're connected and I know that there's, there's a, you know, that extreme zoomed out cosmic perspective of co-creator with those uh, neural looking web of, our universe as we can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neil? I was thinking of the co-creatorship of us with our sun and it's like, imagine looking into the sun and it's just a blank white screen and our experiences on earth are going to put a canvas on the sun's we're going to paint the sun's blank canvas with our experiences. So the sun's kind of providing us the place to experience, but it's blank. And then we do everything that we can here and on Venus and where else. And then that's what gives the sun its understanding of, okay, like there's free will, there's the veil, like it didn't know what was going to happen, but we're kind of co-creating at the same time. That's how I kind of understood. Yeah. Yeah, I think, okay, From I mean, there's so much, <laughs> this session is so packed, y'all, but I think one of the, um, one of the key things that feels really valuable to me to try to take away from it and grok is like, what is love? And in 27, 13, I want to zoom on it, in on it. Maybe, maybe this, this might be the final thing we can, are able to cover today because we only have six minutes left, but, <clears throat> you know, Don asks, can you define love? Um, and then in the definition of it, Ra makes a distinction between love in the context of the second distortion, which is the logos, which is intelligent energy. And the other context is fourth density love, right? The lesson, when we when they say fourth density is the lesson, learning the lessons of love, that's fourth density love. Those are two somewhat distinct concepts. And 2713 is so interesting to me because what they what Ra exposes is that in the order of creation, there's like the one, two, three distortions, free will, love, light. And then those distortions create the octave and the octave is the seven densities. And then the seven densities kind of like recapitulates in reverse the three distortions. Did you guys catch that? So like in fourth density, the lessons of love become come before the lessons of light. Love creates light. So in the three distortions, light is after love. But in the densities, um, first there's the lessons of love and then there's the lessons of light. Is it making sense? There's a recapitulation in reverse. I find that fascinating. 
And there's two contexts of love. There's like this, the, the second distortion love. And then there's the lessons of love. I'm curious if any of you, well, first of all, did you guys catch that? Does that make sense that the inverse relationship between the distortions and the densities? And then I'm curious the distinction between the dent the distortion love versus the density kind of love. Any thoughts on didn't, that? Didn't Ross say that the love also known as the density of understanding? And that one blew me away because we talk about love and light all the time and it's not didn't they say love as under, yes. as dense, fourth density as a, love is equ equivalent to understanding and pure so acceptance that, also right mm -hmm. so then that doesn't yeah that doesn't point towards this in my mind well they're related they're the, closely related but they are somehow distinct and that's what i'm i think that's what i'm trying to like explore with you guys and and see if anyone else has any thoughts on like the second distortion distortion love, which is mostly what we've been talking about this whole session, is related to, but it's there is some distinction of fourth density love. They're not equivalent when, you know, like the lessons of love and fourth density are related to the second distortion love, but somehow there's a distinction. Yeah, the uh second di distortion love is focus. So let's get rid of the word love entirely the second distortion is is focus of like hey let's put my energy into this because i really care about it and it manifests into yep. matter yep and uh the the fourth density distortion is under acceptance understanding mm -hmm. of uh either yourself it's like coming to terms with either your fellow man or or just accepting yourself as perfect in, in a way that allows you to uh is there a focus in that one i don't think there's a focus element of the right there's 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 not really like a focus i don't the, i don't see one i don't i don't see it I'm, I'm with you on that it doesn't seem like it's so much not so much about focus it's almost like the hinge between those two concepts is like understanding comes from realizing that whatever we're experiencing, the creator focused on it. You know, at some level, there's the, the creator wanted it to be. And that's how we can find acceptance for everything. Even the most dark things that we, we might be aware of or experience, they're in our experience because the creator, through its love, second distortion love, chose it. Right, and the fourth density one is a requisite for collective action. That's, that's what I see it as. The, the whole point of fourth density is collective action and it's impossible without that acceptance element. Ah, interesting. Right, fourth density is about collective action. That's interesting, Sean. That makes a lot of sense. Huh. And that's, yeah, that's completely unrelated to, I mean, like collective action requires focus, but it seems like it's two very different concepts yeah right right semantic difficulties <laughs> every every time i say collective action it just makes me think how little how unca incapable we are of collective action oh my gosh <laughs> we're not there yet we got we got a ways to go as a as a <laughs> planetary <laughs> 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 Yeah, for sure. For sure. But either way, the creator's, you know, learning a lot about itself, no matter how collected we are or not. So yep. can't feel too bad about it. That's right. Yeah, I, I mean, I've said this before, but I think in the disharmony that the earth is experiencing right now are the seeds of this planet, what will eventually become this planet's superpower in fourth density. Like, because we've gone through so much discord and disharmony and we'll make it we're going to make it we're not going to blow our planet up i mean we're going to make it eventually you know that the, the 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 capacity to integrate all that and learn the lessons from all the disharmony that has existed in third density on earth i think is going to be the the fertile soil from which 
eventually what Earth chooses as its service as a as a member of the of the Confederation will come from being able to have integrated so much, so many souls, so many different ideas. So anyway, you guys are champions. You're rock stars. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for sticking with all that deep, challenging content. Very very stimulating conversation. I really appreciate y'all for sharing it. Hope you got something out of it. I know I did. It was good. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. I'm, you glad guys, to I'm glad to listen. I'm sorry about the whiteboard earlier. I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to answer you, but my, I was on mute, so you didn't hear what I said. I was so excited. I thought you were gonna like I thought you were gonna get into <laughs> professor mode and let you like break it down for us and just draw the octave and make it <laughs> no. all clear. Yeah, I wish. No, I was trying to figure out how Nia is doing her uh, screensaver thing, you know, with the image of herself. I'm just logged into Zoom. You just logged into Zoom. Mm -hmm. okay. Once you're uh, once you're logged in with the app on your device, then it and you have a photo chosen, then it auto loads it. Yeah, you just so to... when I go to the dashboard and click the link to the call that we're on then it it's i'm still auto logged in okay so <laughs> you do that in zoom but not when you're in a meeting yes correct okay. you go to zoom's website and create an account log in right okay and then you turn auto. your video off it just shows your it just shows your whatever whatever image you've chosen for your your account right yeah might be okay. different if you're on a cell phone probably can't see yeah. right maybe maybe i'll see if i can figure it out after we end the meeting cool all right y'all until next time Hi, hey, Aaron, Aaron, wait yeah have you um looked at scott scott's descriptions of like sessions 27 or the different sessions by chance scott mandelker yeah do you know yeah, if yeah. he dives deep into i'm just thinking of other outsiders that might be able to understand this yeah i have I mean, I haven't been through every se session. I mean, it's like it's like 500 hours or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I've been through a lot of them. I'm pretty sure I've listened to tw 27, but it's been it's been years since I listened. Yeah, I was check that out and see if someone else has some ideas on this because it is way too deep for where I'm currently at. I doubt that. I think you get this stuff, man. I think it's just hard to it's hard for all of us to talk about. <laughs> it's just hard to put into words. But I, you have you have a strong grasp and a strong sense of it. It's my, I don't know. That's what I see from over here. Seems like it. Well, I uh, posted a quo session about the central sun in the Telegram group, so we can. Cool, nice, thank you, appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye all. All right, y'all. See you later. Mwah. See you later. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.